Okay, so good morning. Uh, we start our fourth day, uh, fourth day of our school, literary school in uh, Physica Mathematica. E today we have uh, our first lecture uh, by Luis Agostini Ferreira. Uh, uh, Luis, uh, Luis Agostini uh, did his PhD uh, uh, back, uh, back in uh, Imperial College uh, with David Olive. Uh, and he came back to, uh, to Brazil, uh, stayed for some time uh, at EFT in São Paulo, and then moved for good to San Carlos, uh, where he remains uh, till now. Uh, very active uh, in many different uh, fields, but let's say like, in general area of quantum field theory, uh, integrable models. Uh, and today he will start with his first lecture on hidden symmetries. So he will find for us hidden symmetries. Okay, so uh, Luis Agostino, your okay. floor. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here in this school. Uh, I want to congratulate the, the committee for the organization. Um, following the lectures and it's quite good. Uh, so uh, today, what I'm going to talk about on these two lectures, so it's a, sh um, a short course on hidden symmetries. Uh, first of all, by hidden symmetries, what I mean are symmetries of the physical system, which are not systems of the Lagrangian, the equations of motion, the Hamiltonian. So they are not split symmetry of the theory, but they are symmetries in some other sense that I'm going to explain. So I prepared the lectures uh, to cover the broad audience we have. So I will start with very simple things in classical mechanics, one particle in a potential, okay? Uh, and then I'll move on to more complicated system. And then the goal is to talk about the hidden symmetries of gauge theories in four dimensions it's not a model, it's a physical theory. And uh, so these are, I will cover in these uh, two lectures. You can ask questions whenever you want during the talk, right? Uh, but if the question is too long, then we leave for the discussion section this morning, right? Okay, I'll share my screen. So um, the, the hidden symmetries uh, we are going to talk about, they relate in a quite nice way, uh, integrable field theories, especially in one plus one dimensions, right? Uh, to gauge theories in four dimensions. Everything I'll talk about will be at the classical level, right? Uh, the quantum level is something else that we plan to, to, to study, but that I'll not cover in these uh, two lectures. Right. Um, as I said, there are symmetries of the system, but not of the Lagrangian or equations of motion, right? And they appear in, in a quite general set in all these theories from uh, systems in, in classical mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, then field theory in one plus one, two plus one, and three plus one, right? So, uh, the main idea is the following. The equations I'm going to talk about equates a flux to a charge in a given volume or hypervolume, whatever. So the idea is you have a surface or a hypersurface and you calculate the flux of some quantity here and that's equal to the charge inside the volume co uh, bounded by that surface. Um, the thing is that uh, this equation, right, it's a conservation law. And it leads to an isospectral evolution for some operators uh, in this form, right? Uh, so the eigenvalues of these operators are conserved in time. The thing is that 
is no is a non nether uh, conserved charge in the sense that it's not a symmetry of elegance. In fact, uh, from what I know, the symmetries important for nonlinear phenomena are not nether symmetries, right? They are hidden symmetries because they appear in the system in a way that it's more subtle and brings structures that are very important for the integrability of the model, right? Um, so it, these equations, they underlie uh, gauge theories because you know the integral equations of uh, Maxwell's theory uh, are of that form, right? And I will show you how to obtain those integral equations for non-abelian gauge theories, which have not been constructed until recently. And underlies integrable field theories. I'll phrase the things in a way that uh, what you know about integrable field theories in one Clavon dimension can be written in that form, flux equals to charge, right? Um, and then at the end, uh, I will talk about the integral equations for young Mills, which generalize the integral form of Maxwell's equation and uh, solve a long standing problem of the conserved charge of uh, young Mills theories, right? Which the ones which are constructed on Luther theorems, they're not really gauge invariant. So um, let's start then by, with a very simple example, right? Which is a classical mechanics. So hidden symmetries in a nutshell. So, you know, uh, you have conservative forces in uh, classical mechanics, eh? and the, the special thing is the following. Given the force, you, uh, you can calculate the work done along an arbitrary path. It doesn't have to be the classical uh, solution of the Newton's equation, right? You can uh, define the, path, the, the, the work as that integral. But the, for the conservative forces, uh, the, uh, the, the work has to be independent of the path. So if you change the path, keeping the endpoints the same, right, uh, the work has to be the same. So this allows you to uh, define a function, right, uh, on space, which by choosing a reference point P0, you can stamp on every point of space a number, which is an energy, 32 ergs, 34, and so on, which is this E minus this integral, in fact, uh, which is the potential, right? So uh, you can stamp that number on any point of space, irrespective of the, pa the path you choose to go from P0 to P. Uh, <clears throat> since uh, the integral along gamma prime and gamma are the same, you can inverse one of them and then you have a closed path. So the other way of phrasing it is that the work done on a closed path is zero. But by Stokes theorem, uh, the line integral along a closed path is the uh, surface integral of the curve of that force. So the curve has to be zero. That's a differential form of that statement of our conservative force. And then, and you can think of this curve as a flat connection. So the components of the force can make a flat connection, right? Uh, now, using the work done uh, through now the path that solves the Newton's equation, we know that's a theorem. That's the variation of kinetic energy. So if you use that, you have the conservation of the mechanical energy. So using the fact that force is conservative and this theorem, you get that. Okay, okay. that's uh, just to phrase the thing. But now let's try to get this energy as an eigenvalue, okay? So take this matrix, right? P is the moment of the particle. I'm talking about a one particle in a potential, right? In one dimension. Uh, and then a function of the coordinate Q. If you calculate the eigenvalues of this matrix, what you get is that the, the square of them 
is p squared over two plus k squared over two. If you take k squared over two as the potential, that's the energy, right? So that's just a trick, right? You build the matrix such that that happens. But the question is, this has to be conserved. Then these eigenvalues have to be conserved. So this matrix has to evolve in time through an isospectral evolution. Okay. You want that. So you have to find a matrix U that gives you that. So um, if you take the time derivative on both sides of this equation, you get the Lax equation, which is this one. And uh, you have the, let's say, the Monte Carton form of this matrix U, right? Now, if you choose this matrix U such that du dt u minus one with a minus sign is this matrix and plug it there, what you get is that it becomes proportional to one matrix, it is sigma three, right? Times Newton's equation. So whenever Newton's equation holds true, that's zero. And if that's zero, that equation holds true. And then A has an isospect revolution and that eigenvalue is conserved in time, okay? So here you have a hidden symmetry. That's the first one that we are going to talk about because now you have phrased the dynamics of this system in terms of two by two matrices. So you have this gauge symmetry uh, based on the group SU2, right? So A transforms like that and B in this way, like a, a gauge field, okay, as in one dimension. Okay, this symmetry you don't see, it's not a symmetry of the Newton's equation, right? It's a symmetry that appears when you phrase the dynamics in terms of these matrices. Okay. <clears throat> now, what's the use of this symmetry? Let me show you how you can solve the system using this hidden symmetry. Right? The first thing you play a trick. You introduce a fake variable x and nothing depends upon x. Okay, just you just time. But you call, you take that two matrices A and B and make a connection A, X, A, T. So in two dimensions, let's say. So the lax equation you had becomes the curvature of that connection. So you have a flat connection in this fake space, X and T, right? Now, you can build the Wilson line for this uh, connection, right? That's the definition of the way uh, the Wilson line giving a path. You integrate that equation along the path. You parameterize the, the path by sigma, right? And you get uh, the Wilson line. And the formal solution is this one in red. Right? Just take the, the, time, the derivative with respect to sigma. You can see that this is a solution of that thing. Right? But the point is that uh, if you take the Wilson line now defined by that equation and vary the curve, okay, the variation of the Wilson line times the inverse of it is this integral, which is the integral is proportional to the curvature of that connection. But by Newton's equation, that curvature is zero. So uh, the Newton's equation implies that this connection is flat, as we had before. But more than that, the Wilson line is path independent. You can change the path, and the Wilson line doesn't change as long as you keep the endpoints the same, right? So if you want to integrate uh, the Wilson line, you can choose any path between two given points, let's say the, the blue one, right? The way I order the, the Wilson line is from uh, right to left. So you integrate on this vertical path, you get the integral B, which is the time component. And then a, along that one is a t, but nothing depends upon x. So that's just t times a t. And the same for the red one, okay? So uh, what you have is you call u, this integral of b, right? The path order of b, you get back the time, the isospectral evolution of a, okay? 
So I, we have built a Wilson line uh, operator for this classical mechanic thing. Now, uh, the general solution is quite simple to construct. Since any path gives the same result, choose this one, and then the Wilson line is this thing. W of zero is the integration constant, right? Then you integrate along the horizontal path, along the X, not independent on X, and then on the vertical one, you get the, this one. I call this one U, so you get this thing. But note that the A is emission, right? And B, it's under emission. So U is unitary, right? Because of the exponent, the path order of that thing. So if you take the transpose complex conjugate of W and multiply from the left, you Q the U, right? And you get that this X is given by this one. So it's the integration constant conjugating this exponential of A zero time T, right? So you have solved the thing because the, the, the time dependence is explicit here. Nothing depends upon T. And you have written the solution in terms of this matrix X, which is the Wilson line complex conjugate times itself. Now, you can see that this X parameterize the phase space of your system, okay? The way to, to see this uh, is this thing. So the A0 and W0 contain the initial data of your uh, trajectory, right? So write the matrix in terms of the SU2 uh, generators, right? Uh, and you can, observe that there is an automorphism of order two of this algebra that leaves A odd and B even under this automorphism. So U is invariant, okay? So um, if you take the U back, you, then you can construct this quantity, which is W multiplied by sigma acting on W inverse from the left, right? And if you do this and use the fact that U is invariant, you get this quantity, which is essentially what we had before, but now is not the complex transpose conjugate, but the inverse of the sigma acting on W zero. Okay. But note that this thing is what people call the principal variable in an asymmetric space, okay? So if you multiply W by an element of the U1 subgroup generated by T2, which is the invariant subgroup under the automorphism, okay, this X doesn't change because since H is invariant, the sigma cancels out like U has cancels out on here, right? Because it, it lies on the U1 subgroup, okay? And then, this X is what's called the principal variable of this metric space SU2 over U1, which is two dimension, and it is the phase space of your particle, right? One thing. So that's another way of integrating uh, this system, okay? Um, that's a very simple example, but it contains a lot of ingredients that we are going to use in the more complex system um, we, we, we are going to treat, right? You can generalize this to a mechanical system with more degrees of freedom, right? Then the smart space here uh, is going to be the, the CPN. In fact, this is CP1, the complex projective space, and you can go to CPN. And uh, so the structure uh, is there. So. Well, what we have done is used the, the hidden symmetry of this mechanical system to construct the solution that you know very well, but in another way, okay, that is going to be useful in what follows. Okay. So the next system uh, is a two-dimensional system and uh, it's a pendulum, you see, arranged in a line, okay, and they are uh, connected, you see, by a torsion uh, 
you, you, you have something that what's holding them together here has a torsion force. Uh, yes, there's a torque on, on this thing. So um, again, we take Newton's equation for this system. And the, the first force that you have is a gravitational force acting on the pendulum, right? And the other one is the torsion, okay? Uh, so if one pendulum moves with respect to the other, there is a torsion coming from that thing, linking them together, and uh, you have this thing. So um, if you call theta of xi, and xi is, is the coordinate of the pendulum on that horizontal thing, uh, and delta is the spacing. Of course, this force here makes a second derivative, right? Uh, it's the discrete version of a second derivative along the x variable running on that line. Right? But you have already a second uh, time derivative there. And if you take the limit such that the spacing goes to zero, but the, the constant given the torsion goes to infinity in such a way that delta square alpha is finite, you get the sine Gordon equation, okay? So that's a mechanical version of the uh, sine Gordon equation. And this C here that plays the role of the speed of light is this quantity here, alpha delta square over, and, and L is the, the length of the pendulum, right? And omega square, which like a mass, right, is G over L. Is the period of the pendulum without the torsion. Okay. Now, uh, there are two regimes, uh, two, there are many, but the two important ones for this equation. The first one is, is small oscillations, right? So you, if you look for small oscillations, so sine theta is theta, this becomes a linear equation. And uh, the solutions are waves traveling along this uh, curtain of pendulum, let's say, right? And uh, K plays the role of the momentum of these waves. Uh, omega is the, the frequency, right? And uh, in capital of, of omega is the, the energy, right? So, um, these are the, the, the plane waves, let's say, uh, for small oscillations. But if you look for the other region where you can have um, uh, big oscillations, right? You have this Salton solution, which is the kink, the famous kink solution of sine Gordon. And uh, it's, it's an exact solution, it's four times the arc term of this exponential, it travels with constant speed, V, right? And this is the profile of the, the angle theta, right? It's, it comes from zero here, there is a flip and then two pi. And the, the, the thing is that it travels with constant speed, but in a funny way, because as the pendulum fall uh, under the action of gravity, it decelerates, not accelerate in such a way that it comes down here at rest. So as the kink pass, the, the curtain here remains at rest because what you would expect that it would oscillate, right? Some oscillations would be left here. That's what happens in an ordinary uh, system of like these one, but these one, no. So the energy is not lost. So the kink remains with a speed V because if you had left some waves behind, it would decelerate and it would come at rest at some stage. Uh, so it propagates without dissipating energy. And if you collide two of them, and that's a much more complex uh, thing, they don't destroy itself. They just suffer a time delay, okay? And then you have a topology because uh, you cannot undo this uh, kink, right? Uh, if, for instance, you have proper boundary conditions at the ends of this line, right? Uh, being uh, fixed at the walls, right? 
And the thing is, when you quantize this theory, uh, the excitations I talked before, which are the, uh, the small oscillations, they are described by the theta field. They are excitations of the theta field, right? But in they are, you are in the weak coupling region. But when you go to the strong coupling region, uh, the mass of these excitations becomes small, right? Another important thing here is that the mass of this excitation is inversely proportional to the coupling constant. So in the weak re coupling regime is very massive and very hard to excite them. And the strong coupling, uh, they become, uh, they have a very small mass and so it's easy to excite. And, uh, and it's better to describe this excitation in terms of the theory model. In fact, they are the, the excitations of the fermion field of the theory model. So it's a duality between Sigurd and theory, theory model that was shown by Coleman long ago, right? So it's one uh, quantum field theory, which is uh, exactly solvable, right? Now, classically, uh, what's the magic of these uh, solutions, right? Again, you can write the dynamics in terms of matrices, okay? You introduce a matrix A0 and a matrix A1, right? And uh, in diagonal here, you have the space derivative and there the time derivative, and then you have the exponential of theta. But pay attention that you have a parameter lambda here, which does not appear in the model, but you can plug it there because it doesn't affect what do you want? If you calculate the curvature uh, for this connection, like we did in the mechanical system, uh, Newtonian mechanical system, you get again the same matrix sigma three multiplied by the sine Gordon equation. So whenever the sine Gordon equation is satisfied, holds true, this connection is flat, right? So you have a gauge symmetry because if the, the, the F is zero, any gauge transformation of it is still zero, right? So that's a symmetry of this system, which does not appear in the equation of motion, right? Not, not in the Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, but it appears when you phrase the dynamics in terms of this matrix, right? And the, the symmetry, the hidden symmetry here is a loop algebra because this parameter here um, can be arbitrary, can be even complex. So in fact, you don't have just a pair of matrices. You have an infinite number of pair of matrices for, for any number, for any value of lambda. So uh, you, you, you can phrase uh, this algebraic structure in terms of the loop algebra, which is just multiplied by the SE2 generated by powers of lambda. Polynomials of lambda. But the important thing is when you add a central extension to this algebra and promote it to the Katz mood algebra, right? then the representation theory of this algebra is much more complex and richer than this one. Right? In fact, here you can have uh, unitary representations. Okay. Uh, and you can use this Katz mood algebra to solve exactly the system. So this hidden symmetry it does not appear in the equation of motion. It's important uh, to solve the system and you solve exactly the same way with the path independence, right? Which I'm, I'm going to show you now. So the fact that F, the curvature is zero, the Wilson line is path independent. It's the same reasoning I used in the Newtonian mechanical system. So what you do is this. Now you have a true two-dimensional uh, space. It's not the fake system, it's space like in the Newtonian mechanics. And uh, let's take these two points, x minus L and t equals t, and x equals L and t equals t. I will take this L to infinity at the end, right? And I choose these two paths, just a straight, and then like this U form path. So since it's path independent, the two integrals are the same, the two Wilson lines are the same, but uh, to get the conservation, as usual, you have to impose boundary condition. 
So we impose that the time component of the connection is periodic in X equals L and minus L. Right? So then you get, again, an isospectral evolution that this, the Wilson line calculate on this path is the Wilson line calculate on the same path of T equals zero conjugate by this matrix U because uh, the integral on the vertical axis here due to this boundary condition is the inverse of that one, okay? Uh, so that's the, the U operator. So then the eigenvalues of these operators are constant in time. But remember this A depends upon lambda. So you can make a power series expansion in lambda here and you get an infinite number of conservation laws of this thing. And that's what makes it integrable, right? Um, so this structure that appears in sine Gordon, it's what appeared in any soliton theory in two dimensions, right? Uh, any uh, equation that has exactly soliton solutions in two dimensions, I know of, have this structure. Uh, the zero curvature or Lax equation or Lax Zakharov Shabbat equation, right? Which is the curvature is zero for this connection. And um, here I show a picture that was taken in Glasgow in 1995 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Kortweg de Vries equation, which describe uh, waves in shallow uh, channels like this one. Uh, and it was first discovered there in Scotland in, 18, uh, in the 19th century, right? But the equation was uh, written down by two Dutch guys, uh, Korkweg and De Vries. And that's a conference. Kruskal is here, though, and lots of people that have contributed to this thing. So that's a quite well established uh, area of mathematical physics and physics. Uh, and uh, everything can be uh, described by flat connections on cat's mood algebra, okay? And um, <clears throat> another way of phrasing it is that uh, you have a linear problem, right? And the integrability condition for that million problem is the flatness of this condition, the curvature should be zero, okay? Uh, that's the original uh, formulation of this thing by the, the, the Leningrad school, by the Sato school in Kyoto and others. And um, so you have infinite number of conservation laws for this thing. Uh, the, there is the inverse scattering method to solve this linear problem. Another version is the dressing method, okay? Or the rota method, which is a, a much simpler version of this thing. And uh, you have much uh, <clears throat> sophisticated structures in this thing, which is the classical R matrix, okay? I won't have time to talk about these things or the quantum R matrix. And this now plays, nowadays plays an important role in this connection between correlation functions in super young Mills theories with four supersymmetry in four dimensions and uh, statistical mechanical system like spin chains, right? Which are solved by this uh, Young-Baxter equation, okay? And this connection has been explored a lot, okay? And that's why it lies behind the connection between integrability and supersymmetry uh, young mills theory uh, in, in the context of the ADS-CFT uh, conjecture. So uh, <clears throat> that's the structure. Okay. Now, um, this has been developed in the last uh, 50 years, I'd say, or more, 60. Okay. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's a quote, quite well uh, mature and established uh, structures in mathematical physics. So it's a very rich uh, uh, mathematical structure that allows all these magic things to happen, right? Now, the question is, uh, if you want to go to higher dimensions, right? Beyond one plus one, things change drastically, 
right? And here comes the question, how to find the charge uh, for field theories in dimensions higher than two, right? Um, the, the, this question has been uh, trying to be answered in many ways, okay? Um, but uh, I'll show you one which Mr. Holmes has told me, okay? Which is the following. Um, in two plus one dimensions, we should expect the charge to be integrals over two dimensional surfaces, right? So take a surface sigma, right, with a border gamma. So the charge would be integrals along surface like this. That's what you expect. The Nether charge, for instance, or field theories in two plus one are like that. But as I said, Nether charge usually are not important for the solvability of this theory, right? So uh, if you scan a surface, let's say take a point on the border of this surface sigma, right? And uh, scan it with uh, loops starting and end at the point X zero on the border. There is an infinite number of ways of doing that, okay? But I scan is such that any point belongs to one and only one loop. So the loops don't cross, right? Uh, so you can uh, scan the surface with loops. So you can think uh, of this surface as a sequence of points on this functional space which are the space of maps from the circle S1 to the space time, such that the north pole of S1 is always mapped on X0. That's this famous loop space, right? It's the first loop space I'm going to talk about. I will generalize to other ones, right? So if you do that, uh, you can think of this surface, right, as a path in loop space because this point x0 here is the infinitesimal loop around x0 and then every loop there is a point here because that's a function on this space so any point here in loop space is a function so you describe one loop there so and the end point is the border of this surface so you have a, a path in loop space okay so you have flat connections in uh, space time, right? So the idea is to introduce a flat connection in loop space. That's the first thing you can think of, right? Now, note that uh, in two plus one dimension, you are using this loop space with the maps of S1 to M, okay? Um, if you go back to one plus one dimension, Right, so you have a red a path in space, but you can think of that path as a path in loop space, which are the maps from S zero to M. What is S zero? S zero is just X zero square equals one. So is X zero equals plus minus one. So it's just two points, right? Since you are fixing one, so the loop space is isomorphic to M. So the omega zero loop space is isomorphic to the space time. And that's what you have there, right? But here, no, then it changes drastically because that's an infinite dimensional space, right? Uh, so the idea is this, you construct the, the charge from this flat connection on loop space. The question is, your field theory doesn't live in loop space, okay? So you have to build this connection from things in your field theory. So the first thing you can think of is this. You take a rank two tensor, g mu nu, right, in space time, and uh, a connection a mu, right, on, uh, on space time. So that's w is the Wilson line for that connection. So you conjugate the rank two tensor B 
with this Wilson law. Uh, this is integrate on a given loop, so it's a point in loop space. So this quantity is defined on loop space, local in loop space, right? And uh, that variation here is perpendicular to the loop. So that's what will give you a one form character for this uh, quantity A, calligraphic A, okay. Now, um, the reason why I conjugate with W is because I'm going to apply the theories that have local symmetries uh, is the following, because this connection has a gauge symmetry, which are transformed like that. And the Wilson line transformed like that is G at the end point, on the left, then the inverse of G at the initial point here, right? So when you conjugate B with that, and if B transformed by conjugation, like in the adjoint representation, it doesn't really have to be the adjoint here. I can give examples where it's not, but it's still transformed on the conjugation, right? So what happens is that uh, that local symmetry becomes a global symmetry. So this A here, you kills the local symmetry of this connection in space time, okay? And, uh, and this makes easier for you to preserve this local symmetry in loop space, because if it, the integrand here would change under gauge transformation in space time, it would be a mess, right? So then uh, I, make this local gauge symmetry in space time a global symmetry here on this connection, but I'm going to have gauge symmetries on loop space time, right, which are much bigger. And I'll use this notation. Whenever you have a upper index W here, it means I'm conjugate the quantity with the Wilson line in this way, okay? Now, now you calculate the curvature of this uh, quantity, right? That's because that's what I want to be zero. So if you calculate the curvature of this connection, you get this thing. You get here an integral on the loop, which is the exterior covariant derivative of this rank two tensor. And the covariant derivative is here is in the adjoint representation, is this one, right? Uh, with a double integral on loop space, but it is the same loop, right? With a commutator, which involves the Bs and Fs, that's the curvature of the connection in space time, right? Um, which is this funny combination B minus F conjugate with the Wilson line and then commuting with B. Um, that's a, a funny uh, thing. But it, it, it appears whenever you take these uh, connections in loop space. And in fact, people working in category theory uh, get that. So then what you want is that uh, you define a field theory where these B and A will presumably depends upon your fields. And you want the equations of motion to make this connection zero, right? But the problems start here. To have f equals zero, this condition is local in loop space, right? Is non local in space time. So you have some difficulties, not some, a lot of difficulties to describe local field theories uh, through this formulation, because that's a non local uh, equation in space time. Is local in. in. For some time, we thought that integrable theories in higher dimension would be non-local theories, right? It could be defined on this space only. There is another problem here, which is quite serious, which is this following. Given a surface in space-time, there is an infinite number of paths in loop space that correspond to the same physical surface. So you have a reparameterization invariance problem here. At the end of the day, your results have to be independent upon the path in loop space you choose to describe that particular surface, right? So it's quite hard to reconcile with local field theories. 
However, you can simplify things and get uh, local conditions. I think we have a question. It's me, Luis. Uh, yeah. I'm a little confused because SU2 appears in a very natural way in the, pro in the examples you, you showed us in the uh, beginning. What's yes. the underlying group now? Okay, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, is it right to think that uh, SU2 appeared there in a natural way because of the dimensionality? No, uh, when I discussed those two examples in the Newtonian mechanics case and the one plus one thing, I used the example of SU2, but you can do it for any Lie group. For instance, you have, a, a, take the total field theories. You have a total field theory. In fact, you have many total field theory for any Lie algebra. In fact, any Katz-Mood algebra. It doesn't have to be SU2 only. For instance, you have the SUN to the field theory. Then you have the SUN Katzmuth algebra, right? Uh, and then you have many fields, not just one, like the sinusoidal. So you, you can have a E8 to the field theory. You have a, well, there is a connection between uh, the Ising model and E8, right? It's a very interesting connection. So, I kept SU2 to make things simple, right? To have two by two matrices. But I forgot to say that you can do that for any Lie group or any loop group, in fact, any Katzmuth group, okay? That's another thing I haven't said, uh, that the structures that appear there is the Katzmuth group that's not quite well understood yet, right? In fact, just to, since you asked, um, you can treat, the Lie algebra you can treat, that's well done. But in the group, you are exponentiating an infinite number of generators, and there is a problem of the convergence of the exponential map, okay? Uh, Katz, Victor Katz, have uh, shown that if you have an integrable representation for this group, and this integral has nothing to do with the integrable field theory. It's integrable in the sense that the operators of the Lie algebra, so the Katzmuth algebra, are nilpotent. There is some power of it, it is zero. Then the exponential map truncates to some order. And then you have a, a, a polynomial and not an infinite series. And then you can sum. And then the group element in those representations, that's called integral representation, um, are suitable to treat these groups. So you have a groups in a given representation where you can make sense of it. And this funny thing is that the realization of these representation is in terms of vertex operators. The vertex operators that appear in string theory, in many condensed matter physics like the quantum Hall effect and so on. And the, the, for let's take the Fubini Veneziano vertex operator. Right? It's the simplest example. And they lead to this integrable representation. And the funny thing is that they lead to the integrable system. These soliton solutions are constructed in this integrable representation of Katz mood algebra. So then the two words integrable in the sense that the exponential map truncates, and integrable field theories get together through this vertex uh, representation of Katz mood algebra. Now, coming back here, uh, as I said, you can simplify this thing. And in fact, you kill most of the structure, but you can still do something which is interesting, uh, which is this. You take the connection A to lie in any Lie algebra, let's say finite Lie algebra. And you take B to form an abelian subalgebra of this non semi simple Lie algebra. This is like the Poincare algebra, like P's are the translations and T's are the Lorentz, right? So if you do that, what happens is that B is a billion, right? But it's an invariant subalgebra. So when you conjugate B with the Wilson line, you still remains in the abelian subalgebra, right? And if we impose the connection to be flat, so this F is zero, this is a billion, so it commutes with that. You kill this commutator. 
And then you are left with this local equation, which is the covariant, stereo covariant derivative of B0. So that's your zero curvature condition for your uh, field theory, which is local in space time. So you have killed most of the structure, but you still can describe some interesting models like the CP1 model, SQ model, SQM Fadeev model, and even self Duyan news you can phrase in these things, right? Um, another thing is that uh, this construction I have told you about connects with a lot of things being done in mathematics, like GERBs, which are generalizations of connections on principal fiber bundles. So the GERBs are the, 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 what they call the two form connection. Some people call it two form connections and you construct the principal fiber bundles for these connections and they are GERBs is one formulation and this is other. We also relate to higher spin gauge theories, right? Um, so there is a lot of mathematics to be explored in here. And uh, so two references of what we have done in these areas, these two, right? Back more than 20 years ago, right, 98. Uh, but this doesn't work, okay? As we would like to. In fact, a lot of people working in this area may be wasting their time insisting on this kind of formulations, right? So, quite Mr. Holmes, that's not quite the answer, okay? The answer is more subtle, okay? So let's go back to one plus one dimension. Right? And this comes the idea. That's what we are going to use, right? And it took us some many years to, to realize that. Okay, and that's what works. So now you can pay attention, forget the rest, right? Uh, go back to two dimensions, one plus one. And now you phrase your dynamics, not only with A, but with another field G, it's a group element, which was a red there, okay? which was already there, but we haven't paid attention to this thing. So um, you take a path, any path in your space time, and on any path, you define this integral equation. That's an integral equation. So is the Wilson line for the connection A me, A mu on that uh, path, and then uh, you equate the Wilson line to the group element, which is local here, it's defined on every point of space time, on the end point and the inverse of it on the initial point. So it's an integral equation. You impose that for any path in, in space time. Okay. That's a quite uh, difficult equation to work with, but uh, as you see, it's quite simple. If you change the path, you don't change the endpoint. So the left-hand side doesn't change. It's only the right-hand side that changes, okay? But you want the equation to be true on gamma prime. You have imposed that equation on any path gamma prime, gamma, let's say gamma prime. So then this thing has to be equal to that. So this has not changed. If it has not changed by changing the path, it means A is flat, it's path independent. So this equation is saying that A is flat, right? So, and this leads to conservation loss, like we did before. So it's another way of phrasing the zero curvature, but in terms of an integral equation, okay? Now, um, I'm not doing a lot of things because this is exactly, the is G, is like, it is the Wilson line and that's the integration constant, right? But I'm starting with some G which is independent of A and I impose this equation. It's another way of phrasing the problem, right? Now, if you take the path to be infinitesimal, so X is infinitesimally close to XR, you get the differential form of that equation which is the Maury-Cartan which I use is pure gauge. So then it's flat, so you get the exact line by equation and you get whatever you had before. So it seems that the right way to proceed 
is to uh, look for integral equations in higher dimensions, right? So that's what you should look for, for integral equations in higher dimensions, where you have uh, what I said before, because uh, you have a volume or a hyper volume, okay? And you have an order integral on this volume, which is equal to a flux on the border of this volume. So if you change the, the volume without changing it the border, the border of it, you conclude that this F calligraph is a flat connection. And you get it for free. So that's how you should proceed. Uh, you should for, look for integral equations in higher dimensions, right? Uh, which is what I said at the beginning of the talk, you look for flux equals charge, right? And that's what we are going to do uh, in the second lecture, right? Uh, in two plus one dimension and three plus one dimension. And the mathematical tool to do that is the Stokes theorem, because that's a Stokes theorem, right? then you have to build Stokes theorems in higher dimensions for higher uh, forms, two or three forms and so on, okay? And um, use this Stokes theorem to, uh, to do, that's a Stokes theorem in fact, right? You know, let's say it's the zero Stokes theorem because it involves zero uh, dimensional uh, borders, right? And you can take, think of this G as the flux coming out at the end point and the GR as the flux entering the, the other the initial point. So you have a flux of this field G equals to the charge inside this path right, given by the, the density is the connection. So that's the, the, the idea to go to higher dimension. You will still be dealing with flat connections in loop space, but uh, the reparameterization variance will be solved trivially. You won't have problems with reparameterization variance because it, it is by construction, you get it, right? That's what I'm going to show you tomorrow, right? So it solved this problem. And, uh, and it leads. And the funny thing is that the generalization of integrable system in uh, higher dimensions are gauge theories. And you can think of integrable systems in one plus one as a gauge theory, because the, the basic uh, uh, equation in a gauge theory is flux equal charge. And the zero curvature or the lack sakharov shabai equation in one plus one can be phrased in that way, a charge equal to a flux, right? So it's not the gauge invariance of that connection which makes it a gauge theory, it's not, right? It's this dynamics that makes it similar uh, to gauge theories. Of course, gauge theories uh, are not integrable in the sense that we understand. But as I will show you, it has a hidden symmetry in loop space. And that's quite big. And that's what we are going to explore in now. I'm going to tell you uh, tomorrow. So I'll stop there. And uh, okay. we already have one. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you.